let's talk about old stuff for a while. So my name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the session, that's where you do so. I highly encourage it. I'm the director of Runtime's Integrations, Engines, and Services at Platform SH. Yes, the acronym is deliberate. Uh, we're a cloud-based hosting and development tool company. More on us another time. Before that, I was a consultant with Palantir.net in Chicago for a little over 10 years, doing almost entirely Drupal, not completely, but mostly. Uh, web services lead for Drupal 8, uh, and general purpose huggable person. So, this is a computer. It's a very old computer, specifically the IBM System 360 Model 20. The IBM System 360 was the world's first <coughs> complete range of compatible computers. This is the first time that we had multiple models of computer that could run the same software. This is a very novel concept when it was announced in 1964. And because of that, it was the first system to really make a distinction between architecture and implementation. Because it was the first time that anyone had to think about multiple possible implementations of the same design. Now, as any t computer project, it took uh, longer than expected and more money than expected to build. It took about two years, and then shipped for the next decade with modest upgrades uh, at various times. There are actually a number of different models in the series. The 20 was the smallest of them. This is the low-end machine. <clears throat> but one of the great things about it was that it was compatible with a number of different peripherals. So, for example, it could do data storage on spinning tape, or on this really crazy new cutting edge technology called a spinning magnetic disk. This was a phenomenal advance in technology. You could so store thousands of bits of information on something the size of a small refrigerator. This was fantastic improvements at the time. Uh, and many of the concepts from System 360 are still with us today. Its legacy does live on in, for example, the 8-bit byte. The idea that a byte should be eight bits wide is not inherent in technology. It's not inherent in the way computers work. Before System 360, various systems had different byte sizes. The most common was six, a six-bit byte, which had the small problem of not supporting both upper and lowercase characters. So before System 360, most systems only supported uppercase. Why uppercase instead of lowercase? Well, lowercase is actually easier to read if you only have one, but the CEO of IBM refused to allow their company name to appear in lowercase, so they were all uppercase. Ego. The idea of addressing memory by byte instead of by individual bit offset comes from System 360. This is huge. This was completely new and different, and now we take it for granted. But it comes from System 360. It's not inherent in technology. It's just how systems since then have worked. And of course, it also develops the character encoding called Epsidic, which nobody uses anymore because ASCII beat them out. So not everything lives on from there, but many things do. System 360 itself still lives on as the IBM Z series mainframe, <coughs> which is still in, in use today. You can still buy these. If you have to, have to ask how much, you can't afford it and can still run software, in some cases, written for this, the System 360 without recompilation, which is pretty damn cool. And yes, it also runs PHP. <laughs> the lead team for System 360 consisted of Gene Amdahl as the lead architect and Fred Brooks as the lead project manager for it. <clears throat> it was actually Brooks who coined the term computer architecture. He was the first person to use that phrase to refer to what his colleague Gene was doing. And after the project was over, they went on their own merry way to do various different things. And went their academics, so they ended up in universities, of course. And Brooks went on to write a book in 1975 called The Mythical Man Month. It's actually a collection of essays covering his experience on System 360 and other academic research to date on project management, on software management, on how one develops large-scale systems. <clears throat> the 
he uh, released a revised version of that in 1986, 20 years later, called No Silver Bullet. Me, no, sorry, 1986, he really had an essay called No Silver Bullet that followed up on some of these concepts, and then a revised version in 95, I apologize, uh, that added some material and went back to look, okay, 20 years later, is this still true? 20 years later, are these concepts about how one manages software projects still true? And his conclusion was, yep, most of them still hold. It's been another 20 years and change. What I'd like to do today is look back at the things Brooks was saying 40 years ago and ask, are they still true? Are these statements still valid? I'm going to follow a somewhat different outline than Brooks does. I'm actually going to cover less than half of what's in the book. I will go out and go ahead and say, nobody should be allowed to manage or be part of a software project without reading this book. So everyone needs to go out and buy a copy. I get no royalties from it. I just think it's, everyone needs to be uh, reading it. <clears throat> so first off, you may have heard of Brooks' Law before. Um, adding people to a late software project makes it later. The, the way it's phrased apparently predates the book, but he's quoting it. Bottom line, communication is hard. Communication is really hard. And communication gets harder the more people you add. In fact, it gets harder faster than the number of people you add. Not quite exponentially, but if you have two people, you have one communication interface. If you have three people, you have three communication interfaces. With four people, you have six, and so on and so on. The more people you have to keep track of, the more communication channels you have, and that grows at a combinatorial rate, faster than the number of people. Every person you add makes everyone's lives more difficult. It adds overhead for everybody. Why? <clears throat> Part of it is people cannot work in a vacuum, because most tasks are not parallelizable. You cannot have two people working in isolation without bumping into each other. As a management talk, so I have to have a Dilbert cartoon. I hired all of you because this project will take 300 person days to complete. There are 300 of you, so you're all going to be done today, right? Right, OK. Why? Well, some resources are limited. You may have you know, 300 people, but that doesn't mean you have 300 computers. You don't have enough uh, servers for them all to work in parallel. You may have different skill levels. You, you may have one person who is great dealing with the database. Just give her the database, and, and she can break any SQL query you want. But please keep her away from the CSS. And someone else who's great at the CSS and can do wonderful things with CSS and JavaScript, but do keep them away from PHP for your own safety. I'm in that first category. You don't want me doing your front end. Plenty of people who are way better at that than I am. So the people are not interchangeable. And some tasks will block others. You know, developing components separately and mocking pieces out doesn't guarantee they're all going to actually work together well. I can't write queries against the database until I have a database and know what the database structure is going to be. I can't build a UI in CSS and HTML and JavaScript until the UI design has been done and so on and so on. This is true even for unskilled tasks. It's not just in software development. A couple of years back, I had friends in Chicago who were moving to New York. And so a whole bunch of us got together to help them pack their, <coughs> their apartment up into a moving van. And they had some, we had about eight people, eight, nine people, and they had some hundred boxes they needed to pack. So we should just be able to throw a hundred people at it and be done in about five minutes except we have one elevator, and it's five flights up, so no, I'm not taking the stairs. The elevator only holds so many boxes at a time, plus people. We only have three dollies. We only have one moving van. The person actually packing the van itself needs to be someone who's going to be there to unpack it in New York, so they know where things are. Only the people who packed it in the first place know which uh, boxes are fragile, and so they should not be on the bottom. Some boxes are heavy enough that they require multiple people. Even for an unskilled task that, in theory, anyone can do, just carrying boxes, you still have separate skills, separate tasks, and a limited number of people you can throw at it. Simply throwing 100 people at that task would not have gotten the uh, apartment packed up any faster. Of course, the bigger question is why anyone would want to move from Chicago to New York, but it's another story. <clears throat> people and months are interchangeable commodities 
only when a task can be partitioned among many workers with no communication among them. None. If you have to talk to someone else, the task is not completely parallelizable. Also, adding people, especially late, incurs cost. How long will this project take if I add two more people? Well, add one month for training them, that's gonna, when I'm training them rather than doing work. One month for the extra complexity of there's more people involved, there's more opinions, so we have more you know, coordination to do. And one month to deal with, with their drama, because people. Yes, projects have a natural number of swim lanes. That's the agile term for it. <clears throat> number of swim lanes are the number of parallel lines of work that can be done easily without people stepping on each other's toes. <coughs> Having 10 people modify the same code file at the same time is a recipe for disaster that will never work. Depending on your application, there may be a different number of swim lanes. Could be three, could be five, could be eight, could be two. I would argue the maximum number of developers you can put on a project is the number of swim lanes plus one. Putting more than that on, you're just gonna step on each other's toes and you're not going to actually get any benefit from adding more people. The plus one is so you have someone to review code, you have someone, uh, you have a spare capacity if someone goes on vacation or is sick. Swim lanes plus one. Note I'm talking about the number of developers. This doesn't count your project manager or your designer and, and so forth. <coughs> In fact, this is all, also has math behind it. It's called Amdahl's Law, after Mr. Gene Amdahl we talked about before. You can ignore the math, it doesn't matter. The, the important point is that it, quote, gives the theoretical speed up in latency of the execution of a task at fixed workload that can be expected of a system whose resources are improved. Translation, how much improvement you can expect when you throw resources at something based on how parallelizable it is. But note, no matter how parallelizable uh, it is, you know, no matter how, how separate the pieces are, they're still diminishing returns based on the number of resources you throw at it. And this is true for processors or people. There's diminishing returns when you throw more resources at a task. So what do you think? That was 1975 he's saying this. Still true? Yeah, totally makes sense to me. <clears throat> In fact, when I was working on this talk uh, originally, I was lamenting on Twitter about the fact that I had way too much content because it was a really good book and I was never gonna fit it all into one hour session. So someone suggested I get a second speaker on stage and we both give our talks at the same time and then you'll get all, all the content in one hour. Right. Do we know any projects though that try to solve resourcing problems by throwing people at them? Can you think of any projects that try to just get warm bodies in working on stuff? Hmm. Uh-huh. How many swim lanes does Drupal have? <laughs> what should we learn from that? Second point. Estimating sucks. I hate estimating. Everyone else hates estimating. They're always wrong. Why? Well, Brooks argues, you're estimating the wrong thing. Most people, when they give an estimate, are estimating time for a program. That's your proof of concept. That's your happy path. But if you want to actually build a programming system, that means something that you can actually integrate with, that you can build off of, then you need to actually build formal interfaces. You need to do system integration testing. You need to you know, flesh out and document your edge cases. That takes three times as much work as the initial proof of concept. Three times. If you want something that can actually be used by an end user, then you know, to actually make a product out of it, then you need to generalize it. You need to actually write tests. You need to handle your edge cases. You need to handle all of your possible error cases rather than having the system just crash or corrupt data. Uh, you need to factor in time for user documentation and maintenance. This is, again, three times as much effort as the original task. If you want to do both, you want an actual programming system product, a reusable, usable piece of code, you're talking about nine times the effort of the initial built-in-the-garage proof of concept. Nine times the effort. And that needs to include a substantial bank of test cases exploring the input range and probing its boundaries, which must be prepared, run, and recorded. Note, not that writing tests makes it take, long, take longer. 
fixing all the bugs the tests will find makes it take longer. Which incidentally means this is 1975. Automated testing was already a thing in 1975. You have no excuse for not doing automated testing. If you're not doing automated testing, you're 40 years behind. Get with it. Also, how fast can you code? How, how many lines of code can you just churn out in a day? Problem. It's not a constant value. It may be different for different people, but it's not a constant value. Brooks points out, extrapolation of times for the 100-yard dash show that a man can run a mile in under three minutes. That was in 1975. Even today, the current best is three minutes, 43 seconds. But if you were running at the speed of a 100-yard dash, it would be two, min or two minutes long. But no one can actually do that. In fact, <clears throat> the academic research in the 70s had already found that the effort to produce a number of lines of code goes up exponentially with the number of lines of code involved. So you get a graph that looks like this. This is, in theory, how, how long it will take you to produce a, uh, a given amount of code in machine instructions. This is how long it actually takes. This is from ac actual academic research. And this is true even if there's no communication. This is true for a one-person project. Why? Because even if you don't have to talk to another person, the code has more interaction points. There's more places where the code will interact with each other. So every line of code you add has the potential to break more things. It means you can fit less and less of the whole program in your brain at once and can't think about the impact on the whole system until you write tests for it and go read this other piece you wrote six months ago and remember how it works and what type weird side effect that you forgot you left in there. Human memory is the limit here. This is also true when you start adding more people. There's a study from Joel Aaron that found that when you have very few interactions on a large project, then one person can produce 10,000 instructions per year. When you have some interaction, for some vague definition of some, it went down to 5,000 instructions. And when there's lots of interaction, 1,500 almost an order of magnitude less productivity when you have lots of people who have to talk to each other. And large, in this case, is 25 people and 30,000 instructions. That was the approximate size of, of uh, code base that he was looking at. Now, you might notice we're talking about instructions. We're talking about assembly code, because that's what people still wrote in the early 70s, half the time. Further research, though, <clears throat> showed that in PL1, which at the time was the most popular higher level language, just kind of like the C of its day. I don't know that anyone still writes in PL1. I know one person who used to write in PL1. It followed the exact same curve, the same equation, but for statements, not for machine instructions. Which means using a more robust language, using a more powerful language, using a more expressive language does improve productivity. The language you're using does matter for productivity, but that same curve still applies. More code means you write it slower. The more code you have, the slower you will write, regardless of how many people are involved. And the more people are involved, the slower still it gets. More powerful st per statement gives you more productivity, but you still have that same curve. What do you think? Still true? Yeah? Yep, I'll give them two for two on this one. But Note we said the large system is 25 programmers and 30,000 instructions. <laughs> How many lines of code are in Drupal 8? This is actually from one of the betas, technically. What should we learn from this? Let's talk about planning. Let's talk about documentation. These are the same thing. You should be writing your documentation up front, Brooks argues. Why? Because only when one writes do the gaps appear and the inconsistencies protrude. The act of writing turns out to require hundreds of many decisions, and it is the existence of these that distinguishes clear, exact policies from fuzzy ones. This completely matches with my experience in consulting. The projects where we sat down and planned out all of our node types in advance 
and wrote down how things were going to work and figured out, okay, what views do we need to build, went far smoother and far faster than those where we just started building node types and figured it out later. Because writing things down to describe to the client what I'm going to do means I go, oh, we didn't talk about that in our meeting. Hey, client, what do you want to do here? Oh, this does not make the slightest bit of sense. Hey, client, let's figure this out before I write code that's going to then have to change anyway. Writing it down is like rubber ducking with your word processor. It lets you suss out all of those little nitty gritty details before you actually run into them and consider them holistically. But the manual or written specification is a necessary tool, but not a sufficient one. Your formal definition, your code, is precise, but it's not really readable. And it misses the why of your system. Why are you writing it the way you are? Why are you making these decisions? The why is important. The why is a critical part of documentation and why documentation is always necessary. When I joined Platform SH about seven, eight months ago now, um, it's a startup, which means everything worked, but everything had been written quickly, so not necessarily documented well. And as a new employee, I was totally lost. So the first thing I did was try and figure out how stuff worked and write documentation for it so that I had some clue what we were doing. Our documentation's gotten a lot better since then, since I took it over, but you know, the why behind things is important. It helps you figure out if you're doing things in a consistent, learnable fashion. This requires top-down design. You architect your system first, and then you can refine your architecture top-down to break each piece down even further to produce modules. And you can do this recursively, layer by layer, and have a, a picture of how the system is going to work. And then you can implement each piece and reassemble them into your larger system. And make sure that you can debug and test each piece separately from each other. And when you run into problems, inform back up the process and say, hey, this thing doesn't actually work. We need to refactor something above it. And if that means going all the way up to the top, so be it, but you're still planning top down. This is divide and conquer, which is the most important approach to anything in science or mathematics or programming. If you have a problem that's too hard to be obvious, you break it down into multiple problems which are then obvious and reassemble. That is the basis of anything we do, is divide and conquer. He also argues that you should plan to throw one away because you will anyway. Your first version is the one you write when you don't know what you're talking about, and so it's always going to suck. So just assume you're gonna throw away version one, don't bother shipping it. See also Windows version one and Windows version two. You know the old joke, Microsoft doesn't get anything right until the third version. It's not just Microsoft. Now at this point, someone is probably going to say, Larry, you're describing waterfall. Don't we know that's a terrible thing? And in 1995, Brooks looked back and said, wow, I was describing waterfall, that's a terrible thing. And so he revised this claim, revised his recommendation, to design top-down, but implement iteratively. You start off by building an end-to-end -end skeleton that will compile, that will run, that will produce Hello World, and has stubs in place for everything you are going to build. You don't necessarily have it written, but you have everything you know, plugged in with null implementations of everything you're going to need, more or less. And then you always make sure it compiles and runs. <clears throat> you keep iteratively working on it, but you always have some kind of working system, even if two-thirds of it is stubbed out code. No, that initial system may be a lot more than just you know, a week's worth of work. That baseline could be three quarters of the project or half the project, that's fine. But you're still implementing off of that iter iteratively. And you grow modules in place. If, once you have them in, you know, have your skeleton, you can grow components into where they need to go. That also means that you can throw away individual pieces as needed without breaking the whole system. You have a whole working system now and say, oh, this piece isn't done work anymore. You still end up writing the whole thing twice, but you can replace it in bits and pieces. This is called refactoring. Refactoring is the art of throwing your system away a little bit at a time. Plan to, for a system you're going to refactor because the odds of any line of code surviving from the first version to the final version are really low. 
structure your system in such a way that it makes it easy to throw it away a little bit at a time. But this approach necessitates top-down design, for it is top-down growing of the software. You have your framework and you grow your pieces into place and let them evolve, move them around if necessary, but you're growing them into place. Also, common sense, if not common practice, dictates that one should begin system debugging only after the pieces seem to work. Architect top down, but debug bottom up. If you start with an integration test, you are doing it wrong because you now have 50 times as many variables to keep track of. You want to, to debug at the smallest possible chunk of code, which means your chunks of code need to be really small. Otherwise, you can't do unit testing. At this point, someone is probably saying, but Larry, you just described Agile. And I'm going to say, this is terrible. Who's seen this picture before? Yeah, this is terrible. Do not think, think this is how you do software. Because this is not how technology works. Who has ever tried to turn a skateboard into a car successfully? <laughs> it doesn't work. OK, maybe you can add something there, but you have to throw it away for that. I've never taken a, boat, motorcycle, excuse me, a, a bicycle and turned it into a motorcycle. Doesn't actually work. You can't actually turn a motorcycle into a car. You're throwing it away each time. That doesn't actually work. This is a terrible way to design software. <clears throat> Instead, you start with something vaguely approximating what you're planning to build. And then you can add features and functionality to it. But you start with an A-frame. I know I'm going to have a motored car, a motored vehicle, with four wheels and doors. And everything I build, even as I evolve it, <clears throat> is supporting that end goal. It's still the same basic concept. And I can add doors, I can remove doors, I can change out the trunk, I can change the tires, but the skeleton is still the same. It's still basically the same product. This also means you are not going to build the most client important feature first. Agile says you build the most important feature first. It's wrong because if the most important feature is a bay window on the second floor, you don't start by building a bay window on the second floor. You start by pouring concrete for the foundation of the building. I don't care if the most important feature is <clears throat> You know, a, a JavaScript slider on the home page. That may be the most important feature, but I need to actually have a login system before you can build a system to edit that. And trying to build, you know, the, build the spit and polish before you actually build a foundation gives you a terrible mess. <clears throat> what do you think? Still true? Yeah. I'm going to say this is still true. So he's two and a half for three at this point. With, with the revisions from the mid-90s. In 1986, uh, he gave a lecture at a conference called No Silver Bullet, which he turned into a, an essay, in which Brooks argues that, that there is a difference between essential complexity and accidental complexity, or incidental complexity. <clears throat> essential complexity is complexity inherent in the problem space. E-commerce is hard because e-commerce is hard. Who's, who's worked on e-commerce sites? E-commerce is hard because humans and economics, not because of technology. Accidental complexity is our t the stuff around it is hard. Our tooling is weak. Our ability to cut through cruft and get to the actual problem is difficult. The hard part of building software is the specification, design, and testing of the conceptual construct not the labor of representing it and testing the fidelity of the representation. Remember, he's saying this in 1986, having worked in the 1960s. In the 1960s, the way you ran your code to see if it worked was you took your stack of uh, punch cards down the hall, got on the elevator, went down two flights, walked across down the hall again to get to the room with the computer, waited in line behind other developers to run your stack of cards through the machine, wait for it to barf in one of them, take the stack back up to your office and stare at them for a while until you figured out what was wrong. We have come a very long way in our tooling since then. We now have computers that we can carry. We now have the ability to read code rather than just have punch cards. We can execute our code locally. We have real-time debuggers. We have instrumentation that will find bugs for us. We have tools that will find performance bottlenecks for us. The entire you know, realm of hard incidental stuff around computing has fallen away. There is absolutely still room for improvement, but 
not the tenfold improvement we saw going from punch cards to a real-time debugger. There's no single development, he's saying this in the 80s, which by itself promises even one order of magnitude improvements in productivity, reliability, or simplicity. There is room for improvement, but nothing that's going to revolutionize the industry. Not a programming style, not a new tool, not a new language. All of the low-hanging fruit has been taken care of already. So if we want to be more productive, what do we do? How do we attack that essential complexity? He has three recommendations. One is rapid prototyping that lets us grow organically based on user feedback. We already talked about that one. <clears throat> the second is buy versus build, and then mentoring better architects. He points out that the most radical solution for constructing software is to not construct it at all. Just buy it off the shelf. Just use something that already exists. And if necessary, change your organization to suit the software rather than changing the software to suit you. Why does this make sense now? Well, in the 60s, a computer cost $20 million. So spending $50,000 on custom software for it that's exactly what you need is a rounding error on your budget. These days, I can get a gigahertz computer with memory and storage for 10 bucks. It's this big. So the cost of software dwarfs hardware dramatically. So it is far more cost effective to change my organization to suit a piece of software than the other way around. If we can reuse software and not write it again, then we can save a ton of time and a ton of money. If I don't have to write a new spreadsheet, I can just use one ready-made. I don't need to write a new web server. I can use one ready-made. I don't need to write a new language. I can use one ready-made. I don't need to write a new HTTP client. I can use one ready-made. He didn't have the term yet, because the term didn't exist, but he just described open source. Open source is the number one productivity improvement of the last 20 years. Don't write more code. Reuse code that already exists, and make sure your code is going to be reusable for that same reason, for you and other people. The way to be more productive is to write less code. And the way to do that is to reuse more code. How about growing designers? Important note here, we started off using the word architect, and in the 80s, Brooks switches to using the word designer. It's a very important shift, a very important distinction. Because software construction is a creative process. Study after study shows that the very best designers produce structures that are faster, smaller, simpler, cleaner, and produce with less effort. The difference between the great and the average approach is an order of magnitude. Oh my god, 10x developer, oh my god, that's terrible. No, the design. Working with a design that doesn't fight you can be a tenfold improvement. A good designer that gives you a system that will work with you, that lets you go with the grain, can give you a huge productivity boost. That's not the same thing as developing lines of code. Software architecture is much more like graphic design than it is engineering. Architecture is not the same skill as coding. It is a different skill set. They overlap, they interact, but it's a different skill set. And both need equal recognition as equally important parts of building a software project. <clears throat> Which means we need to mentor our architects, mentor our designers. We need to identify candidates who may be good architects early, who are not necessarily going to be the best or most experienced developers. I know plenty of people in Drupal who are excellent developers who can write wonderful code, but can't redesign large-scale systems. I also know plenty of people who are really good at designing a system, designing a content model, who are OK at actually writing the code behind it. They're different skill sets. We need to pick out the architects and train them in that. Give them a formal mentor. Emma was talking about this yesterday. Give them a formal mentor who can teach them and train them over a long period. Give them apprenticeships. Give them formal training in that. Send them to conferences for software architecture. Give them opportunities to try their hand at architecting smaller things, failing, and doing it again, because that's how you learn. Encourage collaboration with other designers. Send them to conferences like this one to meet with other uh, people in their field who can look at design, not just optimal algorithms. This is all stuff that the design world, the graphic design world, does. It's something that we need to do as well 
for software designers. Think it's still true? Said in the mid-80s, hold true? I would say yes. He definitely got open source right, and in my experience, the points you make about architecture are completely true. Conceptual integrity. This is, Brooks argues, the, this is really the thrust of his entire book. This is the overriding concept. The conceptual integrity of a product, as perceived by the user, is the most important factor in ease of use. You want to have one mental model. The user needs to have one mental model to have to think about. Because the ease of use of a system is not a simple uh, you know, linear factor, A is easier than B. It is a ratio of the amount of functionality you get for the amount of contact, contact, conceptual complexity I have to learn. Neither function nor simplicity alone define a good design. It's the ratio between them. Take a 3D modeling tool like 3D Studio Max or Lightwave. Those are incredibly complex. It takes a while to learn, but the things you can do with them once you learn how, to, how they work and how to think with them are phenomenal. You can build you know, Hollywood quality movies on a shoestring if you understand these well. That makes them easy, you know, high ease of use for what you get out versus the functionality, what you get out versus what you have to learn. At the other end, a basic text editor like Notepad, very low functionality, but it takes about four seconds to learn. Okay, maybe 12 seconds. So it's just as easy. Notepad is just as usable as 3D Studio Max because of the amount of learning you have to do for the output you get from it. Insert joke about Vim here. Simplicity and straightforwardness. I'm a nano user, not Emacs, so I stay out of that fight. <laughs> Simplicity and straightforwardness proceed from conceptual integrity, which means conceptual integrity is the most important consideration in system design. It is better to have a consistent design than to have more features. See also the early iPhone. Lacked so many features that everyone was complaining about, and yet the features it did have all fit together well. And that's why it was successful, because what it did do, it did well, and it added features later. It is better to have fewer options and have more options that work than to just throw a whole bunch of options at somebody and hope that they stick. Conceptual integrity of the product not only makes it easier to use, it also makes it easier to build and less subject to bugs. Because not only is the user only responsible for learning one mental model, the developer is too. If this piece of code makes, calls things with this set of nouns and this piece of code has a completely different set of assumptions about how the data model works, then no, I'm never gonna be able to match those up. There's going to be a mismatch in the middle that makes the code ugly and hard and buggy where those two concepts meet. So how do we get good conceptual integrity? Through smart division of labor. The design must proceed from one mind or a very, very small number of agreeing resonant minds. That does not mean monothink. It means people who are aligned with each other, a lead team that has the same vision for the, how the system should work. And Brooks proposes two ways that that could happen. One is the surgical team, in which, you know, like in an operating room, you have a surgeon. They're standing over the patient, and they're work actually working. And you have a team of five, six people around them who are doing everything else other than touching the patient. You have someone handing the surgeon you know, a knife. You have someone taking the old knife away to clean it. You have someone dabbing uh, sweat off their forehead. You have someone keeping the family away and calm somewhere else so that nothing interrupts this one person doing this job. I've never actually seen a software project run that way. Yeah. So his other option <clears throat> is to split the architect and implementer role because these are separate jobs with separate skill sets. The architect is the user's agent. It is their job to bring professional and technical knowledge to bear in the unalloyed interest of the user as opposed to the interest of the salesman, the fabricator, the manager, the investor. The architect is the user's agent. They are responsible for the usability of the system in a top-down fashion. 
Now, I'm sure someone's going to say, oh my god, but that's cathedral design, not bazaar. That's aristocracy. That's dictator dictatorship. And, well, yes, that's how software works. That's how design works. Design by committee, we all know, is terrible. And that's true not just for graphic design, but for software design as well. You can't build a bazaar that's eight stories tall. Cathedrals are frequently that tall and last for centuries. Bazaars shift around daily. This is how Apple works. Apple may have lots of designers, but at the end of the day, Johnny Ives is calling the shots at, on every product. At Google, they've got lots of different designers. They've got variations between different products. But Matthias Duarte is the one calling the shots. He's in charge of design across the entire Google product line. The Unix architecture goes back to the early 70s and hasn't changed dramatically. If you're dealing with the Unix architecture or the POSIX standard, these are standards set down that you follow that someone else gave you and you follow them. If you're doing anything on the web, you're using HTTP. Does HTTP not work the way you want? Too bad. This is the architecture we have that was designed and we follow it. The architect is responsible for designing the idea of a watch that's a dial, you know, dial in hands. The implementer builds the, the gears and bells and figures out how those all fit together. These are both challenging. These can both be fun. The architecture can support money implementations. <coughs> you, know, the, like you could have a, a watch this big or something the size of Big Ben. The same basic architecture. Democratic architecture is a big ball of mud. The architect must always be prepared to show an implementation for a feature, but not attempt to, impl impl to dictate the implementation. This is a collaborative process and with high communication. This also reduces the communication channels. Everyone talks to the architect, the architect talks back. Now I've got a number of people plus the architect communication channels. This lets your team scale. You can divide and conquer and have different pieces of the system have different sub-architects for different parts of the system. This lets you scale. Do we know any systems that have no actual lead architect or vision and so are kind of a messy, inconsistent mess as a result? Do we know any systems where the team has shifted over time dramatically and so there's bits and pieces of old architectural decisions poking out? Do we know any systems where there were a relatively small number of people whose vision really drove the product and drove the design despite the pushback they got and it is therefore a more consistent, easier to use, easier to learn, more powerful system as a result? What can we learn from that? Now we're talking about large systems here. How big are we talking about? Is this reply to every product or just you know, huge enterprise grade stuff? from Brooks, after teaching a software engineering laboratory more than 20 times, I came to insist that, insist that students with teams as small as four people choose a manager and separate architect. Four. Project manager, architect, two developers. Incidentally, four is also the smallest unit in most militaries for the same reason. And that unit has a squad lead. Four people, and you already need separation of responsibility and separation of concerns. Either the manager or the architect can be the boss on the project. It doesn't matter which one it is. It doesn't matter who has final authority as long as you all agree on who it is. As long as one of them is and everyone knows it. So what should we learn from all of this? 40 years later, software construction is a creative process. It is much more like graphic design than we, than we like to think. Divide and conquer is the number one tool for developing anything. Break the problem down into smaller pieces that are, will fit together and then fit them together. Build shareable system products, AKA use open source. It is the number one <coughs> productivity improvement of the last 20 years. To do that, you need to have, be able to decouple your libraries from your framework. You should not be building most of your code coupled to your framework. Drupal, Symfony, Zen, Laravel, whatever. Most of your code should be built as independent of that as possible and then integrated into it. That way you have those small divide and conquer reusable pieces. 
Design top down. Don't just throw code at something until it works. Have a plan. Will the plan shift over time? Absolutely. But if you have a plan that you change explicitly and decoupled libraries you can move around within your architecture as the architecture needs to shift, you will have a much easier time with it. And empower your architects to make decisions. Arch you need to have a consistent, clear vision for your product, and that comes from a small number of decision makers who should absolutely be informed by talking to everyone on the team. Everyone on the team should have a voice, but not everyone on the team makes a decision. High-level decisions need someone who has a bird's eye view of the project, and they need to be able to make those calls and have them stick. The idea that people knew a thing or two in the 70s is strange to a lot of young programmers. From Donald Knuth, author of The Art of Computer Programming and considered the father of the analysis of algorithms, who most people have, these days have not actually heard of, and yet was one of the founders of our industry. What can we learn from this? Thank you. I'm happy to take questions until they throw us out, so. <laughs> we have a mic here, if anyone. I think right behind you there. Any questions? Questions, comments, rotten tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, in that case, think what you can learn from this, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>